Hi everybody, welcome to Read Science and today is the happy birthday edition. Happy birthday to my co-host Jeff and I'm going to turn things over to him for first announcements. Yeah. Thanks very much Joanne. Uh, and the, today's episode is special for reasons other than just my birthday. This happens to be the first episode of our third year doing Read Science. Oh, yeah. which, uh, Yes, which I think is very exciting, and we are revisiting a topic that we first talked about nearly two years ago. The subject is cancer. Today's guests are author Sue Armstrong, whom Joanne will introduce in a moment, and George Johnson, author of The Cancer Chronicles, Unlocking Medicine's Deepest Mystery. George Johnson describes himself as, I'm quoting from his website, a writer working from his office in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which I'd say is true if over modest. He also wrote that he was, quote, more comfortable with the sharp edges of cosmology and physics than the wet, amorphous, ever-changing terrain of cancer, which is pretty much how I feel about it, too, being a physical scientist, but I'm here to learn. Of his nine books to date, the two next most recent were The Ten Most Beautiful Experiments from 2008 and Miss Levitt's Stars, The Untold Story of the Woman Who Discovered How to Measure the Universe from 2005. He's been shortlisted three times for the Royal Society's Winton Prize for Science Writing. He's a co-founder of the annual Santa Fe Science Writing Workshop. He's written for a number of magazines that are familiar to all of us. And he is currently writing a monthly column for the New York Times called Raw Data. Thanks very much for joining us from Santa Fe, George. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Okay, Joanne. Oh, and I uh, get to introduce Sue Armstrong, uh, who I, I think this Hangout's been about six months in, in the works here. Uh, I was looking back at when I first corresponded with you, Sue, because um, I was looking, well, what do I add to her bio here? So Sue Armstrong is a science writer and foreign correspondent who has worked for a variety of media organizations, including New Scientist and BBC World Service. Since the 1980s, she has undertaken regular assignments for the World Health Organization and UNAIDS, I hope I said that right, writing about women's health issues and AIDS, the AIDS pandemic, among many other topics. Uh, the author of A Matter of Life and Death, Inside the Hidden World of the Pathologist, and today's book, uh, P53, The Gene That Cracked, The Cancer Code. You've got the wrong one there. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, that carries all, all you white spots on them. <laughs> okay, P53, the gene that cracked the cancer code, um, both by Armstrong and she lives in Scotland and we're on a little later than we planned originally. My fault, totally my fault. You can't trust me with world clocks. Uh, Sue, welcome and say hi to our audience. Thank you very much. Lovely to be with you, and uh, happy birthday, Jeff. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Sue. Nice. Yeah, Jeff. One of these years, uh, we'll hit my birthday, and yeah, we mm -hmm. won't. We won't tell All anybody right. my age, so yeah. we'll we'll and <laughs> keep it a secret. That's the one old-fashioned thing I happen to like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Jeff, why don't you start off with a question for our guest? Well, and and let's let's keep it big for a moment because it seems to me that one theme that keeps coming up in these cancer discussions that certainly is behind every chapter of both of these books is how big the question of what is cancer one word but the thing so big and even more profound now that it's my birthday I can recognize that and say how much cancer understanding has changed even in my lifetime and so I'm going to quote something from George's book uh, that I thought said a lot about that this is your essay question he wrote things are rarely as simple as they seem and what appears to be complex may be no more than ripples on the surface of a fathomless ocean oh, sounds portentous but things have certainly changed and the way we thought we understood cancer when Nixon was president we'll get to that is a lot different from the way we understand it so in 50 words or less George uh, would you like to survey everything that's happened in the past 50 years uh, sure <laughs> <laughs> I mean really the key idea is that cancer unlike any other disease it's, it's not an infectious disease although sometimes infections can trigger a cancer, but cancer 
is an example of Darwinian evolution going on in your body in a very sped up manner. And uh, the way I like to think about it when I was writing the book is that it's almost like a little quasi-organism or a quasi-creature or would-be creature is trying to evolve inside the ecosystem of your body. And what from the point of view of the, of, uh, what from the point of view of us, the bodies are, um, dangerous, deleterious uh, mutations are, from the point of view of the cancer cell, uh, advantageous mutations. It's becoming fitter and fitter and uh, to the detriment of its, of its host. So I think the really key idea, oh, you can trace it back you know, quite a few decades, but many people uh, look at a paper written by Peter Knoll on what was called the clonal selection theory of cancer. And basically the idea is that, you know, cancer randomly generates mutations and then they're selected for fitness. And that's why it's so extremely difficult to treat because whatever you throw at it, um, you know, it's it's likely to evolve a workaround. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sue? So if I, if I might answer that also, I would say um, one of the uh, big difficulties of cancer is that in a way it's just ordinary life um, got a little bit out of hand. Yes, exactly. um, and uh -huh. that, that's the terrible thing about it. That's what makes it so desperately difficult to address because it is, you know, to a certain extent, one of the great mysteries is when you have a wound on your arm or something like that, it'll fill in the space and somehow your your body knows when the wound has reached the surface mm. and it stops. But with something mm. like cancer, it can be the same kind of thing. It's the same um, filling in holes. It's the same um, multiplying and and it's the same ordinary growth systems. But they just don't know when to stop, or, oh. or it's, it's it's death things which don't know when to when to um, happen as well. So it's it, it takes over the general systems of living and they just keep going. That's the problem. This is, That's you two are going to agree vehemently on this as well, that, <laughs> that cancer is almost a thing that is, is just a consequence of being alive, that it is part of being alive, yeah. that it, as you say, Sue, and as George has also written, it, it uses all the mechanisms of living, and this is where it comes from, why it's so multitudinous in its, its forms, and also why most of us can't escape it if we live long enough. Yeah, yes. it's essentially, I'm sorry, it's... Um, Again, a, a way I, I, I think about it, um, you know, when I write about cancer is that it's really an inevitable consequence of the fact that we're multicellular creatures and we're living in a world that's governed by entropy. Uh, things, you know, things fall apart. <laughs> As things get more complex temporarily, it's only at the expense of um, creating disorder somewhere else and eventually the system's going to break down. So if you don't die first of um, heart disease or a stroke or something like that, at some point you're going to have to die of something and it's likely then to be cancer. As we, as we go back to Sue to finish this, um, I mentioned to Joanne that I read in the New York Times David Kwan's review of George's book and there was an equation in it that seemed perfectly summarizing the book, and you just mentioned it. He wrote this equation, he wrote down entropy times mitosis times time equals breakdown. And I think this is something that we're going to be talking about a lot as we try to understand, I don't know, the simple view of so much going on. And and now, passing back, so P53 certainly has a lot of stuff going on just with this one protein and this one gene. and Boy. Does. One something? of the things I was going to, to go back just to um, rewind a little bit to what um, George was saying. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is yes, if we live long enough, we're we're bound to get um, you know we're almost bound to get cancer. It just happens um, just because of the number of times everything's um, dividing. But one of the great mysteries is that very big animals don't necessarily, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily proportionate. You don't mm -hmm. get much more um, cancer in whales or in uh, elephants than you do in human beings. Um, so, you know, th there, isn't, there isn't a direct relationship between how many cells you've got and how often they divide and cancer. Mm -hmm. It's, so there are lots and lots of little mysteries. But then one of the things I found fascinating about studying um, biology is that it is 
it's so beautiful and yet it's also so messy. You 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 think you've learned you think you've learned something and then something comes from around the corner that says, Oh yes, but and so that's that's the thing. You can never There's say always an exception. Exactly. There's always an exception, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, to go back to your thing about P fifty three. No, no, that's fine and and you made me think you were talking about large animals that reminded me <clears throat> that we learned um, in George's book that we like to think we, we like to think in popular culture I think that cancer is a modern man-made thing that comes from living life dangerously in the 20th and 21st century mm -hmm. and now we find out from George that dinosaurs had cancers that the earliest identifiable hominids had cancers. This is something that has, has always been around and something that happens to everyone and again is part of life. Um, and you, you gave a number, I've got it someplace about the percentage of, of cancer sightings in the archaeological record. But yeah. that, that's a pretty fascinating place to start. But we're not the only one that gets cancer and it's not just because of, uh, I don't know, 20th century chemical process. Well, yeah, that's something that, that was one of the big surprises to me when I started delving into this subject, oh, back around 2010. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, if I knew, if I, I knew then if I really thought about it that the cancer must be, you know, something that's been there ever since you had multicellular creatures because, you know, cells are constantly dividing, and every time they divide, they have to copy their DNA. So inevitably, you're going to get errors, and inevitably, in an imperfect, entropic world, not all of these errors are going to be corrected, which is a good thing because it's the random mutations in our uh, in our germ cells that have allowed us to evolve and you're <laughs> thinking about all these things. But uh, the really interesting question is to what degree of the assaults of the 20th century and 21st century civilization may have increased the amount of cancer. I mean, of course we know that smoking cigarettes has, but let's say you take cigarettes out of the equation, and, and um, I, I, in, in one of my chapters I tried to uh, you know, trace back and just find the best case we can make for how much cancer there was in the past, and once you get really to the late 19th century, there's really nothing like good uh, good medical statistics and death records. There, there was a study in, in England and Wales uh, in the late 19th century, the late 1800s, that uh, was really the last thing that's considered even semi-reliable. And there was one paper that analyzed that and um, subtracted and adjusted for things like the fact that smoking cigarettes wasn't such a big thing then or that people were more likely to get stomach cancer for various reasons. And uh, this scientist concluded that you really couldn't make a case that uh, cancer back then was at a different level when you made these adjustments than it was mm -hmm. today. So controversial I, because there are so many assumptions and variables. I found that a fascinating chapter in your book when you looked at um, Love Canal and the, mm. the assumptions that people make that, you know, there's nasty things happening in the water and nasty things happening in the air and the cell phones and all this sort of <laughs> stuff. It must be giving us cancer. And you so carefully sort of filleted all of that and looked at it. I found that deeply fascinating because mm. I know it is one of the big, um, it, it, it's one of the big controversies. Nobody dare say anything um, about uh, you know about how much chance um, is in, involved in getting cancer and so on without everybody piling in because it's such an emotive issue oh, isn't it? Yeah. As Joanna and I were, were saying we were talking about this the other day that you know Bert Vogelstein and, and colleagues um, had said something which was picked up by all kinds of newspapers around the oh, world yeah, and just absolutely. slightly mangled and it caused a hell of a mm -hmm. hoo-ha and in fact they were just looking at it exactly the same sort of things as you were talking about in your George. Yeah, I, I, I wrote one of my, my columns about that, one of my raw data columns, because I read the paper that um, originally I was given, given a copy by a friend at the uh, National Cancer Institute, um, in, an advanced copy, and I read it and I thought, this is great. I mean, this to me just seems so <laughs> obvious that there's a much larger role for randomness than entropy than most people realize, which doesn't mean you have to be fatalistic or that you can't prevent many cancers, but it's saying, you know, let's see which ones we can prevent and which, I mean, well, let's see which ones 
are probably mostly the result of randomness and then try to prevent those and the ones we can't prevent you know are the ones that maybe we can try to treat or even cure in some cases but it was a brilliant paper but the reaction of the public and then when I wrote about <laughs> the paper defending it, the emails I got, people were just outraged by the idea that cancer isn't caused because you're not eating kale chips or because, <laughs> because the, you know, the Dow chemical and, and, you know, maybe these are factors, but, uh, you know, particularly kale chips are a very minor. Well, but there are factor. at least a, a couple of things that have come to mind in those things. One, we can't really have that discussion about, um, the epidemiology of cancer and understanding it, uh, because it's still it's still recent that we understand cancer as as a as a genetic problem, as a problem no, with genes. I don't. Yeah, but I mean, that, what you say it's true. We, we, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. You, you can go go on and continue, but no, I, I think and I, I was just going to add into that mix in that we're still seeing a lot of people clinging to the idea that the mysterious disease cancer that is still not understood popularly has to have a cause and their favorite cause is moral impurity or unclean living or uh, you know some punishment for something debate all over again isn't it, it, well, it yeah <laughs> most any debate it seems like it. I mean I guess I would argue that you know even if we did no idea what the mechanisms were of cancer and and we know an, an amazing amount but even if we were completely ignorant of it the epidemiology would still allow you to show that uh, certain things were likely to be risk factors and certain things are not mm -hmm. so yes but for a long time the smoking thing was very much just the epidemiology wasn't it oh yeah very much so and, and that's what's so interesting because smoking you know for an epidemiologist the the, bad, the 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 deleterious effects of smoking cigarettes were just such a strong signal in the epidemiology that it was just you know hard to ignore it, it's like a it's like a risk factor of like 20 times it raises your risk of mm -hmm. of um, lung cancer almost everything else you look at whether it's a uh, a chemical pollutant in the atmosphere or um, or, or uh, red meat or, or anything you want to look at it's just a tiny tiny fraction as big a factor like so small that it's often indistinguishable from noise so there's very little that they found in epidemiology that's as clear-cut as, as cigarettes but actually that's yep. that's where that's where p53 is is so nice mm -hmm. because um, uh, it clinched the um, case against tobacco because when they discovered that the products of tobacco smoke actually uh, affected, um, mutated the p53 gene, the tumor oh, suppressor right, gene, in a book. very yeah. very specific way, yeah. and that really clinched it. Um, yeah. And what they found was that people who had people who were smokers and had lung cancer um, had nearly always had this mutation and it was never wow. in lung cancers of people who hadn't smoked and so that was a, a fingerprint mutation and they found quite a number of them I mean I think there are three or four already I mean s skin cancer has got one and liver cancer caused by um, the aspergillus fungus on moldy peanuts and that sort of thing so there are one or two very specific fingerprint mutations on the tumor suppressor gene um, and and I think that's absolutely brilliant but mm -hmm. as you say for so many other things they can't find an absolute fingerprint they can't they can't they, yeah. there isn't the, there isn't the, there isn't the definitive proof yet and there isn't actually as you say sometimes there isn't even that strong a, um, a connection uh, or an indication from the epidemiology is that well, no, that's true. I mean, they're, they're, they're more like suggestions. And then, of course, there's the standard thing we see where one study comes out, particularly about some food, and then the next study comes out completely refuting that one and back and forth. But it's because we're dealing with signals that are just at the level that they're almost indistinguishable from noise. I really liked in your book how uh, I, I hadn't, hadn't really – I knew that P53 was involved in so many – uh, processes that, that 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 can be corrupted and and um, lead to cancer, and, and I think I have a line in my book somewhere that said, uh, you know, after making some of those points, that uh, 
if you want to start a cancer, take down P53 because yes. you know, domino effects. And uh, but I didn't really appreciate to the extent of its pervasiveness until I was reading your book. So it's just uh, yeah, it's, it's really very it's a very interesting way into the subject. I think you know I think whenever you take a huge overwhelming subject like cancer, you need to find like I think of it as just like this big amorphous sort of swamp and you have to kind of cut through and then every person who writes a book is going to find a different path through the subject and it's interesting to see what uh, how, how different people pull that off. And, well right, I did, I I did like think, to, uh, oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I was wondering how many of our viewers actually go P53 what's that and I was hoping so you might be able to back up just a little bit and wait, before I do that, if you are out there and you have a question about cancer, we do have the question and answer app on. And if you type that in, our guests, I'm sure, will be thrilled to do their best to answer. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, Sue, why don't you back up a little bit and talk a little bit. To, obviously, if you want to know everything about P53, you should read this book. But uh, in so simple sorry. terms... <laughs> what is P53? I should yeah. have said that right at the beginning. Yes, that's okay. I mean, um, as a, I'm a cell biologist. Those of you who watch me enough know this. And to me, this book was absolutely fantastic because of all the exciting things that were the initial discoveries that were happening were happening as I was in grad school. So of course, I'm trying to get an idea of what, you know what's going on with it. Um, so it was still unfolding, so it was great to read this book and see the whole story and the number of people you interviewed. And we'll get to that in a minute, but please do tell us. Uh, okay, well, ba who don't know very, very basically, P53 is one of the genes that's in the DNA in every cell in our bodies. And it, one of its tasks is to, as a sort of um, proofreader, as a sort of quality controller, to ensure that um, when only healthy cells are allowed to uh, divide and replicate themselves. And so it keeps a watch and if, the, if signals come that the DNA has either been damaged by some outside force or um, during the process of division when it's um, copying itself, if the DNA, which is the blueprint, the, the um, recipe for the cells, the recipe for living, if that's damaged, P53 will stop the cell in mid-division send in the repair team to mend the DNA mm -hmm. um, and then set it on its way again, the cell on its way again. If the DNA can't be mended and the cell looks as though it's going to be dangerous, then it can cause the cell to commit suicide. Because the big difficulty is that if the DNA is messed up, it um, you need just one rogue cell and that can trigger cancer. And so it tries to clear out cells that are, while they're dividing, it tries to clear out the ones that are going to cause a problem. And that's, that's its main task. It's the sort of quality controller across our bodies. And um, it was named by the person, one of the people who discovered it has since called it the guardian of the genome because it guards the integrity of your DNA as your cells are dividing. That's basically it. And, and it's called the tumor suppressor gene. And P53 has to do with the weight of the actual protein. That's yes, a, it, it, just... it has a terribly prosaic name, as so many of these genes do. They found it, and they found the protein, and it weighed um, 53 whatever the units are. And so, and they didn't know what it was, and they didn't know that it was going to be anything that special. So they just said, okay, protein that weighs 53. <laughs> and that's it, and that's how it stayed. <laughs> this was before they started coming up with all these wonderful names for genes, like, you know, we had the yes. hedgehog gene, and then the sonic hedgehog, and the desert you hedgehog. The hedgehog the... One, yeah. Didn't you? I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dros Drosophila, uh, the, the little fruit fly that we use as a model, those scientists are really well known for their crazy gene names, so... Oh, um, yeah. That's yeah, really yeah, cool. cancer, too. Yeah, there's, there, there's twist, and... Uh, and um, <laughs> Oh, so, so many of them that they're they're coming to me in a rush and blanking out. That's a lot, like, but I just don't know why they left P53 with such a pathetic name. Yeah, and, yeah. And the thing is, there's a, there's a um, when you when you um, leave your employment in Britain, you've got something called a P. You get given a P45 form, and so many of my friends <laughs> keep calling it. Oh, you've got a P45 gene. <laughs> anyway, That's wonderful. Three, and it is the central. It is the most important um, tumor suppressor in the body. Yeah, but we don't know how to 
uh, we haven't figured out how to exactly target it to cure cancer because sometimes maybe p53 mutates or another protein comes in that uh, can sort of ameliorate the functioning of p53 mm -hmm. so just because we found this really important central protein doesn't mean we can capitalize on it to cure all cancers no. even though it seems really important in most cancers if not all that, that that is one of, that is one of the really big questions i mean i remember when i was first started um, doing articles on this and so on. Um, it was about, it was in the um, sort of late 90s and they thought now we've been studying this gene for long enough, we, we feel we're at a time when we can really capitalize on all the information <laughs> and, and you know, and then suddenly they start to dig away, they think now we know it and it, there's just layers and layers and layers of the onion skin and when you try to address it, it's just so hard because what you have is P53 <laughs> at sort of the center of the whole system and either P53 itself can be messed up so it can't do its quality mm -hmm. control thing or you get other things which communicate with P53 to say there's, oh, a, there's right. a problem, they can be um, hamstrung, or the things that P53 switches on to do its job, they can be um, messed up, and so you've got just so. Oops. <laughs> it, it's you just, just got, a sound switching that Google does. It's not not to be alarmed. It's her. It's her delivery. <laughs> <laughs> you've just got so many things that can go wrong, and so it isn't just a question of let's mend this. Well, yeah. and it's it goes beyond. You've got the mutations, the mutation that cause it not to do something, the mutations that cause it to miscommunicate, the mutations that cause it to overactivate and do something. And then you can start talking about how it gets folded and whether this particular folding causes this right. or whether this particular folding doesn't cause that. And it seems like sort of the one thing we know and is still getting a, unraveled is that P53 seems almost always to be at the center of the action. And that I finally understood when I was getting, say, to the last third of your book, Sue, the gene that cracked the cancer code, I'm thinking, what is it that we're talking about? And the, the answer seemed to me to be that understanding how cancer works could be illuminated extensively in all of its complicated facets by seeing the various ways that P53, who's almost always on stage, is getting involved in what's going on. And there's so many ways to do it. And that is the back to the rhetorical question I was going to ask earlier when I remember I was not all that old but I was not all that young when President Nixon declared war on cancer and the idea was that we were going to find a cure for cancer and my question is do you think that declaring war was premature when we understood the enemy so little as we did in the early 70s uh, I mean, well the, yeah, I mean, you could declare war answer, at any time, but, um, you can. Is, but it certainly, I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, he was looking for something, you know, you know dramatic and rhetorical like, uh, you know, Kennedy going to the moon, but, uh, I mean, declaring war was probably the wrong metaphor because it gives you this idea that cancer is kind of this monolithic thing that, uh, that, that can be defeated in, in, in the same way that uh, so many infectious diseases have become not defeated but uh, you know uh, seriously vanquished at least uh, in the mm -hmm. developed world and as we were discussing before you know with cancer something that's so woven deeply into the very nature of multicellular life there's always going to be cancer there's never going to be a cure for cancer there's going to be treatments and, and some will be better than others. There'll be some cancers that can be cured, and you know there already are, and uh, you know m many more that uh, that can only be controlled. But um, right. and, and I think so much of it too depends on, you know, maybe a better goal back then would have been to say we want to find a way to prevent cancer in young people. Um, mm -hmm because those are the ones that are the most most tragic and we've made huge progress with that just with like the cervical um, a cervical yes. cancer vaccine the uh, um, the antiviral vaccine so I mean something like that could essentially you know come close to wiping out this one you know form of you know just very pernicious cancer or stopping smoking or um, or mm -hmm. researching into childhood cancers have made great progress on uh, on, on curing childhood cancers, even though 
even though sometimes the you know, the cures can lead to some brutal after effects. But uh, but I think forty years ago, I think people people easily expected that we'd find the vaccine that would cure cancer. Well, yeah, like polio and, with smallpox. Yeah, but it's not the same. But, but so isn't. Know, but the, 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 the cervical cancer thing is a very interesting one because the cervical cancer one where they have got a vaccine and that's a, coming back to what you said earlier Jeff that um, almost every time you're looking at cancer when you look at what happens to the p53 gene that's always a player in the field and the cervical cancer is very interesting because there's the virus that causes that often causes cervical cancer. Something in the, a protein from that virus actually goes in and it just chews up the people and um, gets rid of it that way. And that's how that gets that starts. The P53 is mm -hmm. very, very implicated there. Um, ah. And so you can almost always find it somewhere in the yeah. equation. But um, I think, this I idea of... of my, I, I'm sorry, but you can continue. So I think the root of what I was getting at maybe was, does does the course of cancer research in the last 50 years uh, underline something that would be you know important to me as a physicist? The the usefulness of basic research to understand what's going on before mm -hmm. you set out to find the cure for something, uh, well, you because could, you're only going to find that. Yeah. I mean, now we know by understanding the 714 different ways that p53 gets involved. <laughs> Um, yeah, but you know, there's a, there is a very interesting thing because one of my interviewees actually said, um, you know, pe people have begun to feel that oh, we're never going to really um, mm -hmm. get on top of cancer. And he actually said, I mean, he, he was he was a great guy because he ev he kept on saying things that um, were counterintuitive or that really rubbed people up the wrong way, but were really mischievous things. And he said that he said if you look at bacteria and look at what we've done with infectious mm -hmm. diseases, right. at one point when you see just how um, fearsomely fast bacteria mutate and bacteria manage to get their way round. Um, uh, antibacterials and so on and yet instead of saying oh well, we've got a bacterium for TB, we've got t TB of the mm -hmm. lung, we've got TB of the bones, we've got um, salmonella, we've got all of these things, we, we didn't have to find a cure for all of these, we found a broad spectrum antibiotic and we did mm -hmm. phenomenal things with infectious diseases and he actually feels that what we should be looking for in cancer is the commonality in cancer, the, what he called the mission critical thing, the thing without which no cancer can survive. And this might be just a, a common factor that we might, there might be one or two of those that we can actually attack. Um, and I think, I think that's a very nice way of looking at it. Yeah, I was really struck by that when I read it in your book because I hadn't seen anyone make that comparison before. And uh, yeah, it, it really seems to work. And you know, almost everything you read now, the first thing they say is that, oh, cancer is not a single disease, and then for a while they said 100 or 200 or it's 10,000, depending on the, the graininess of, the, of your uh, <laughs> definition. Well, Everyone's is. cancer is individual, and yet it's all basically the same concept, you know, of a cell breaking free of these uh, interlocking controls that are in effect yes. in a multicellular organism. So. Um, maybe the difference with with uh, being able to control so many bacterial infections and cancer is, you know, again, you have the entropy factor with cancer. So, you know, every time you, you, you read about something, it'll say this will prevent, you know, so many thousand or so many million uh, cases of cancer in the next so many years. But what that doesn't say is that the same people may go on to get an entirely different kind of cancer later in their life. So, and again, the older you get, uh, you know, and the more entropy has a chance to, you know, work against your cells, the more likely it is that um, the system will, will eventually break down. But as far as delaying it further and further into life, you know, when you're going to have to die of something, I mean, maybe that should be the goal. Although not as important as the goal of uh, preventing cancer in younger people and, and working on childhood cancers. But there are commonalities. So on the way back yeah. to Joanne, but Sue, is this where we mentioned the, the paper from, I think it was 2000, The Hallmarks of Cancer? Yeah. Uh, and, and its importance in yes. saying that there are common features and we can understand what's going on. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was Weinberg and Hanahan's attempt when they suddenly saw exactly like you say, George, that it's just such a um, a massive um, 
it's just such a difficult and amorphous thing to get to your head around so many different things happening in the cells and they thought well let's pull together some of this stuff and they then um, drew up a list of the hallmarks of cancer the things which happen in every cancer or almost every cancer again in biology you can never say every <laughs> I'm getting wise to that these days um, but they drew up this list of six hallmarks of cancer um, and now they've added a few more as, as we've got more information but it's absolutely brilliant because mm -hmm. this has remained the sort of um, conceptual framework something into which all the new bits of the jigsaw puzzle can be fitted um, and the thing, one of the things that's wonderful about this is um, various of friends of mine while I was interviewing them, or interviewees um, would say that when you looked at it you thought well, what is the common um, element in all of these hallmarks and they said my goodness it's P53 P53 <laughs> has a role in every single one of them either that it's messed up or that something's happened but mm -hmm. P53 is there a key player in every one of those hallmarks which is why you know I gave it the title the gene that cracked the cancer code it's there it's it, it again is um, a nice thing to hang all these um, various bits of the jigsaw on so let me ask here. Uh, so we've got two um, two books, both about cancer, and I would think you know uh, people who aren't savvy to p53 being the gene so central to everything, they may just walk past that book in a bookstore. You know what I mean? Like it, I, I or if someone's afraid of uh, genetics like bad memories from high school, they may not pick it up, right? So um, so when you're writing this book, were you writing it going, you know, this is just a great story that needs to be told and the audience that needs to read it will find it? Or were you hoping to somehow capture a broader audience? And then we'll talk about George's book because his was written from a different perspective. So, mm -hmm. Well, it's it's... <laughs> It's an interesting question that because I'm not a biologist, I'm not a trained scientist myself. Um, you know, I I grew up in a very medical household um, where we talked a lot about sciencey things and so on, and I was always fascinated. But I always wanted to be a writer, and so it was sort of natural that I went into journalism and then I went towards the science thing. So. Um, to a great extent, I'm the audience for um, my my readers. I get abs I find science just mm -hmm. fascinating, um, and but I am aware that the more I the deeper I get into a topic, the more I get to know about it, then probably I'm leaving some of my readers behind. But I keep I I just think to myself that this is yes a really good story and I also have a, a, a burning belief that some really tough science even tough science deserves um, a wider audience it needs people like you know it should reach people like me and I've worked for a long time with New Scientist magazine and I think I got a really good training from them about um, if you use your enthusiasm and make sure you get your facts right, then you know you'll mm -hmm. carry your audience along. And so I try to give as many stories about the people I've interviewed, rather than and, and the excitement of the chase and the disappointments. So it's a human story of scientific endeavour rather than a mechanical story about a gene and about right, genetics. It's not the textbook. This happened and this happened. Yeah. And mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I, I didn't count how many people you interviewed that you included in the book because you probably interviewed many, many more than were included. But wow, uh, you, your book ranks up there with there are so many characters, so many players, just to show how big this field is. And all the stories were interesting. And I always do want to congratulate when people are certain to include. Uh, the women scientists who've done the work as well as the men, and there were quite a few. So the, you know, it's yes. not like this field is lacking for women scientists. Women are drawn towards biology anyway, but um, for reasons, yeah. It's there not are some to the book. such such smart women in 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 the P53 field. Really, really <laughs> wonderful. And and the great thing about them is. That, they struck me as so um, gutsy. You know, there was one wonderful woman in, in the Weizmann Institute in Israel, Varda Rotter, who 
it was, you know, some of the stuff she discovered was so counterintuitive, and it wasn't. She was saying things that people didn't didn't believe because when it was discovered to be a tumor mm -hmm. suppressor, that its job was to clear out to stop tumors, there was still a lot of people who thought that it was a tumor driver that it mm -hmm. fueled cancer, and they weren't willing to change their tune. And Varda stuck by her guns. She, her research wasn't showing this, and you know, and and she stuck with it, and she was right, um, because under certain circumstances, it's a very, very weird gene that um, when it's mutated, it can sometimes become a tumor driver as well. And so she knew that it had this dual face, and she stuck with it, and she's been proved right. So there's, there's, you know, I met a lot of really bright women. Um, in this field, and I, 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 that that added to the attraction of the whole thing too. Yeah. Oh, I well, I love the book. I, you know, I feel like I, like I said, compared to perhaps Jeff, who's a physicist, I already come to it as a cell biologist, already finding this stuff super fascinating. So, now uh, George's book uh, that is you, you are following along with your wife uh, as she was going through cancer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, tell us a little bit about how. You know the story came about. Yeah, I mean that's really what drew me into the subject. As I as I mentioned in my my introduction, that most of my books have been about uh, cosmology or physics. I wrote a biography of Murray Gell-Mann, a, a cantankerous physicist who discovered <laughs> the quark and was um, yeah. uh, kind of a Richard Feynman's alter ego. And uh, <laughs> uh, I wrote a book about quantum computing, and and then the ones earlier that. Uh, uh, the Richard mentioned uh, um, Ten Most Beautiful Experiments and Miss Levitt Stars about uh, how we measure the universe because of a discovery that a woman named Henrietta Levitt made in the early 20th century. So I was looking for something different to write about because like Sue, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm a generalist and a journalist and what I love about this work is I find a subject that I'm absolutely fascinated in and then it's so wonderful to find a publisher that's willing to stake you with some money to to um, absorb yourself into it for you know the two or three years it can take to come up with a book so but in the case of cancer I was really drawn to it um, you know for for what what could have been tragic reasons my former wife Nancy was diagnosed with a stage four metastatic cancer of a very very rare sort with a very low survival rate and at the age of 43 and um, it's been more than 10 years now, and she's, she's um, d doing fine, so that's the good news. So um, We're not married any longer, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of play with that in my book. But I started reading about it. You know, we both did at the time. This was back in um, 2000, 2004 and 2003 end of 2003 and then getting into 2004 and I reread an article that I'd read many years ago at Scientific American uh, by Robert Weinberg, um, one of the two or three probably most prominent cancer researchers certainly in the United States and and I realized later that it was basically a Scientific American version of um, what would later become uh, his paper with Hanahan that Sue mentioned, The Hallmarks of Cancer, about uh, about all these things that uh, have to go wrong in general for a cancer cell to become cancerous. And it was reading that that I really started to realize, wow, this is a little case of miniature evolution going on in your body and the tumor is evolving all these offenses and defenses and workarounds. I mean, one of the hallmarks is that the tumor um, starts growing uh, proliferatively. So what it does is it kind of develops through random mutation the ability to basically ignore or turn back signals from the other cells mm -hmm. that would normally be regulatory and say, whoa, slow down, you're dividing too fast, you know, we can't keep up with you. And uh, it defeats those and uh, then it has its own um, genetic internal mechanisms that are supposed to slow down the cell cycle clock if it's dividing too fast it learns to defeat those and and then there's one of the great roles of p53 is that it can initiate apoptosis or cellular suicide so if the cell is just really really deranged it can just you know you know set off these uh, molecular <laughs> death charges and destroy it but it learns to circumvent apoptosis uh, another one of the hallmarks another hallmark is it learns 
to uh, turn on angiogenesis. Angiogenesis mm -hmm. is the growing of blood vessels, and it's this natural mechanism in cells uh, by which you know they they grow they grow capillaries and then blood supplies. But now the cancer cell co-ops that and hooks into your blood system, you know, both for its own uh, nutrition and to start spreading and metastasizing. Mm -hmm. So that's another hallmark. It develops the ability to metastasize. So um, I, you know, it just fascinated me and. That was in my mind for all of these years, and I was thinking, there's got to be a way to write a book about this, and and it's such a huge subject. I need a I need like a narrative framework. So rather than using using scientists really as characters, I wanted to use my wife's story. But I didn't want to. There, there's so many books and many very good ones. You know where where the person with the cancer is right in the forefront, and and I wanted. Um, I didn't want to do a book like that. I wanted the Nancy story to kind of hover in the background and just kind of come forth as necessary and use it as a connecting, a connecting principle. So um, it's a very different, different technique. And a lot of my earlier books were very much, um, you know, people to scientists. You know, you describe what the scientist looks mm -hmm. like, and then you, and then you, you have them talking, or you have scenes at conferences. And I found that book by book, I do less and less of that, and it's just a personal, personal taste probably. But I have a few scenes in my book involving scientists, but more my goal was to absorb the material as best I could myself and kind of come forth and just say it, and. Um, in, it was um, very nice. There was there was, some, notes. there was there was some lovely bits. I mean, Nancy's story was very nice actually because it was mm -hmm. it was gently woven in, as you say. It was it was ah, it nice. held it held the story together. It held your quest together because mm -hmm. you, you've come back to sort of solid things. But uh, also there were some absolutely wonderful scenes where uh, you were obviously sitting there scratching your head or thinking that this is something that really interests me. When you went off yeah. to that um, radio, that place where you sat and that were bombarded with radio waves. Oh, the microwaves, so. yes, right. <laughs> that was wonderful. I, I thought it was such a vivid image and there were a number of places like that. So no, no, I enjoyed... No brain so far. <laughs> I enjoyed, enjoyed travelling your journey as well and mine was very much Thanks a journey so too. But, yeah, oh, um, yeah. But 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 yeah, my mine was a journey between the you know from from between the scientists and and, yes, and all of that sort of thing. But I really good. loved your your. I mean, the, the, I think that's that's an important thing in writing about science that you yeah. you show that it's an, a, a very human endeavor and that there are people with excitement and the doldrums and and yeah. all sorts of things like that and the competitiveness, but also yeah. that those of us who it's going to affect and who are interested in it, um, I think it's quite nice to show our perplexity and and yeah. and, and our mm, own exactly. Yes, I was just going to say that. I mean, uh, that's one, one another thing. I it's taken me a few books to learn, but but it's okay to say like, mm -hmm. you know, wow, I don't get this, and to show your confusion and your struggle trying to understand. Because I remember at some point I just realized I really don't understand this theory called cancer stem cells, Weinberg's thing. And then the more mm -hmm. I talked to a lot of people, <laughs> including Weinberg and Bert Vogelstein, who doesn't like the theory and Weinberg who's a champion of it, I realized that nobody understands this and it's uh, it's just kind of this this mess and, and maybe it's not even true but uh, maybe it is so I, I just realized that was the only way to deal with it you know just to kind of you know mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a scientist I'm like uh, an interested outsider taking yeah. this journey to try to understand everything I as a layperson can understand about cancer and then try to convey it but uh, you know, I'm never going to entirely get it because nobody entirely gets it. It's sort of a like collective well, knowledge. That, that, Science is filled thing. with with confusion and dead ends and detours and things. And I don't think I you describe those somehow without diverting the story in order to show science honestly, which I think is the best thing to do about science as a human endeavor. It's it's marvelously successful and it does have all of these things that happen in it. And yeah, and Sue had a nice I'm sorry, Sue had a nice quote in, in her book and in, in one of the epigraphs in your chapter from Horace Freeland Judson, who's absolutely my one of my May, I, I think his book, The Eighth Day of Creation, is the single it's best science book isn't it? ever written. And something about how what science is, and your 
And it's so easy for, to later for scientists and science writers to write about something without trying to forget everything that was not known at the time the discovery was made and really capture that sense of looking out into this blank emptiness and not knowing how the story's going to come out. And I thought your Judson quote really, I guess that was from his book about discovery. Yeah. Yeah. A mar marvelous, marvelous book. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I, and I have no idea where this uh, imagery came from, and it, if I w could remember, I would uh, uh, credit this person, but I always, uh, one of my favorite things when someone said was, science is like chasing marbles around on the deck of a ship. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, that's what it feels like most of the time. Mm. I do want to ask, uh, uh, you cannot help, and you both, I believe, have mentioned this book, cannot help but bring up, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Emperor of All Maladies. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I'm only bringing this up because I, of course, he has the crab sitting on the front, and yeah. I thought that it is almost obligatory for every cancer book to describe the origins of the cancer term, and which I think Sue did pretty much very similarly to Siddhartha. But I felt like George, you took this idea that, oh, it's it's after the carcinos that look like a crab, but you took it a little further. Oh, right. yeah, like, there was I something mean, different about it. You know, like, uh, everything, it's not as clear-cut as, uh, I can't remember how I stumbled upon that either. You know, like, so many things, I just kind of came upon some old papers that really looked into this and were questioning. Because I think, I, I think Murkaji said that in his book someplace, too, that, well, yeah, actually, okay. cancer doesn't look anything like a crab, so... Maybe that stuck in my mind, and then I found this old uh, uh, history of science paper, history of medicine paper that suggested these alternate, um, alternate de derivations. And, yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 I can't remember about. exactly what the difference was, but I do remember looking at that and thinking, yes, that is interesting. He, you expanded on it because I think you told quite a lot of the stories about um, why it was why why it was called cancer. Um, yeah. But I think one of the people who suggested it looked like a um, a crab said that it looked like a crab with the uh, the way its its veins and its blood system had um, developed. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. yeah. Or that it's I mean, tenacious, or that... I'm, I'm you know, actually, I'm looking in my book now, I'm trying to find what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I should have bookmarked it, and I didn't. Um, yeah, I just I mean, remember, because I listened, and uh, and then I, as I, I was reading Sue's, I was like, oh wait, everybody's saying this. <laughs> oh, okay, here, here we go. <laughs> Yeah, this is a yeah, this is a, der a derivation that was suggested by a scientist named uh, Louis Westenra Sambone, a British expert on parasitology. So, um, and, and he ended up studying cancer, but he pointed out that there's a creature called Saculina carcini that feasts on crabs in a manner that's eerily similar to the feasting of a cancerous tumor on a body. And, um, and then he described a 1936 report by a pathologist, uh, Alexander Haddow, who goes on to describe this and suggest that, um, you know, maybe it was, uh, um, you know, ancient Greeks dining on crabs and, you know, and noticing these, these kind of parasites that thought, God, that's just like this cancer that we see over in, in, in Hippocrates' patient. And, you know, who knows? It's just, uh, you know, one of those Absolutely. things that's probably lost the time. And, but now... We call it crab. It's so strange <laughs> that that's what cancer means. Yeah. So uh, we're down to about four or five minutes left. So I do want to make sure mm -hmm. that uh, our guests both have opportunities to to add their uh, two cents. Uh, something maybe we forgot yeah. to ask, or something important that uh, you want to uh, be sure to share with our readers about either cancer or communicating about cancer in science. Um, it's it's a free for all. <laughs> well, I guess well, one thing that strikes me is, uh, I mean, there's so much folk wisdom about cancer, and, and, and people generally in the public, readers of the New York Times or, or anyone else, readers of these books, they come to them thinking they really know about cancer because they've experienced themselves or someone in their family has experienced cancer, and they have these ideas that, uh, you know, about where cancer comes from, and and I had many of these ideas when I started researching the book, and one of the eye-opening things was finding out how many of these were, were wrong, that there's actually 
for most cancers, a fairly weak connection between external carcinogens and cancer, mm -hmm. and that for very, very few cases of cancer, actual people getting cancer, you can almost never really trace down you know, the cause of cancer, if it was actually a cause at all other than, you know, half a dozen different random mutations, you know, involving the, the, the hallmarks of cancer. And um, the hard, so the hard part of communicating that is, you know, people just don't believe it and, and they get angry mm -hmm. and they you know, think you're part of, the, sort of some conspiracy at the worst. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking like with the cell phones and I, I did a column on that a couple of, of uh, months ago, well, well, about cell phones and electrosensitivity, and I hesitate to mention it because I'm still in the barrage by just some of the nastiest emails accusing me of, you know, being in the employee of the Verizon Corporation, and and you know, and people who just, you know, just arrogant, arrogant in their in their willful ignorance, and 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 you get that a lot with nutrition and cancer too. I mean, of course, it's very important to, you know pay attention to what you eat and nutrition is important for many many reasons and it has something to do among many 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 tiny little risk factors adding up it has something to do with cancer but again it's uh, it's not nearly as tightly linked as people insist on believing because mm -hmm. you know, they resent the fact that all of these kale chips they've been eating all these years instead of, of uh, tostadas and potato chips are not actually probably going to keep them from getting cancer well, I would say I would say um, that yes, people people don't know, and they and they, they have an idea that they do. I would say don't be fearful of looking at at the biology of these things. I mean, as you say, Joanne, um, they see the p53 in genetics, and they think, oh, this isn't for me. But I, as I say, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a very interested um, right. uh, writer. And I found it. When, if you if you if you engage with it, what goes on inside our cells is just deeply fascinating, and it isn't scary, and it is possible to follow follow <laughs> yes. your way down mm -hmm. there. That's what That's I'd good. say. You can It's something you can understand, and you don't have to be a scientist because you're 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 proof of that. I'm proof of that. And yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> well, and Jeff Jeff and I have uh, interviewed both authors who are scientists who happen to mm -hmm. write really well. But some of our best books are, you know, writers who are able to and not afraid to delve into the science mm -hmm. and, and make a perfect, um, uh, what, what's the word, you know, uh, this perfect, <laughs> buffer is not the right word, Jeff, my brain. <laughs> uh, but someone, someone who's a translator of science because yeah. they had the to bridge, go in and learn Bridge, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, bridge, the, the interstitial thing. The thing I always <laughs> like to mention at a point like this um, and I think it's true for both for both books, but maybe particularly for Sue's. The P53 story is long and complicated. It is something that can be understood, but not if you read the book fast. There are some books that are fine to read slowly because there are so many ideas, and I like to encourage people not to feel like they're being slow or stupid if they're finding it difficult to understand. Read the book slowly. Understanding will grow, and it's, it's worth the time. A yeah, well, a book right. should be more than a horribly long magazine article, and, and I think mm -hmm. too many nonfiction books are just like overly long magazine articles. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you want the you know people who, when people really get engaged in a book, you know, they read and they go back and they flip around. It's what's so wonderful about books? It's a very very different mm -hmm. form. Which is thinking what's about what you're reading is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It shouldn't ha go fast. I mean. You know, like, you know, fiction can be different, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, th thanks, Jeff. I, I, I agree because I do think, you know, you, you have to, you have to concentrate. But hopefully, you know, the, the story is there and it, it mm -hmm. is accessible. It is understandable. You well, that's it. Everything, it. You, yeah, yeah. Everything you need as a general reader should be in the book, so you don't mm -hmm. ideally have to go out and look things up. You know, that, that that's part of the skill. It's it's self-contained, and yet, you know, you're assuming a reader that's smart and thoughtful and wants to ponder things and mm -hmm. and, and find the joy of learning and making connections. And, but it can be difficult. It can be difficult knowing exactly who you're writing for. Because I remember <laughs> one person I gave. <laughs> And I thought, well, is this accessible? A very bright person. And he said to me, uh, yeah, he said, that's fine, but what's a mutation? Wow. <laughs> I, oh, said, dear. I said, what? 
<laughs> know, how much do you have to explain? That's always the, the eternal question. I thought, I thought, well, I'm not going to say, show that to him again. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just I'll freeze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's worth knowing. It's worth knowing. Yeah. You know, you might just put in that it's like a, a floppy disk that's we don't have floppy disks anymore. But it's like a disk that's become <laughs> corrupted. Um, so you know, it's worth saying these things every so often, putting in a very simple mm -hmm. explanation. Isn't oh yeah, it? very. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and doing it gracefully so not that a, you don't turn off the person who knows, it. but you inform mm -hmm. the person who does not. And, yeah. 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 Well, uh, you know, George and Sue, you guys, you guys are <laughs> both extremely delightful people. I am so pleased. I, I was telling Jeff before everything began. I was like, oh gosh, these two are going to be great together. So <laughs> I had that opportunity to chat with you. Um, so. Uh, if you are looking for uh, great books about cancer, there's a couple right here. So P53, The Gene mm -hmm. That Cracked the Cancer Code by Sue Armstrong is a lot of biology but a lot of human uh, aspects of science. It's a great book. And uh, The Cancer Chronicles, Unlocking Medicine's Deepest Mystery uh, is told in a slightly different style with, with uh, uh, following his wife's cancer treatment, uh, diagnosis and treatment. And this too is a wonderful story. And um, I, you know, I recommend either or both as you have time to read them. And uh, thank you both so much for joining me. And uh, sorry, audience, for leaving. Surprisingly, I got two packages. Sorry, Jeff, neither of them are your birthday presents. <laughs> I, I thought you were leaving. I, I thought you were going. <laughs> I, I hear the door knock and it's one package and then I sit down and another knock and it's another package. They needed my signature, so yeah, I guess I'm glad I'm home. But yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt the show, but that's okay. Thank you and George, thanks thanks so very much for Thank such you. a great conversation. Fun. Pleasure to meet you, Sue, and all and of you. Thank you, yes, all of you. That was really good. Thank you very much. Wonderful okay. fun. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye.